He's going to tell And uh, that is my guy, Mr. Dre Miller. How you doing, fam? Hey, I'm doing good, Rashad, man. Thanks for inviting me to this platform. Oh, man, so glad you could be able to be here, man. I really, really appreciate you for dropping by. And then, man, I got my little homie. You know what I'm saying? He ain't really little no more. You know what I'm saying? He's Future. Grown up, and he's huge, and he's really a huge, huge part in the community in which he grew up in, man. He is a future educator. He's currently working in the middle schools right now. He's a community leader. Uh, as, as of today, he's a rap video star. If you haven't seen Amine's uh, Woodlawn, which is just debuted today, and it's already got a little over a million views, uh, he is my guy, Mr. Jamarte Brown. How you doing, Jamarte? Hey, man, I'm blessed. I'm blessed, man. I'm glad to be here, be alive. I'm breathing. I'm well. My family healthy. I'm blessed. Appreciate you allowing Absolutely. me to, 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 to just, you know, Absolutely. showcase my voice. Absolutely. And I want to let everybody know, if you do have questions as we're having the conversation and you want to ask a question, make sure you put it in there in the chat. My girl, Alyssa, uh, was, was going to make sure that she gets that information back to us and we can kind of have uh, some great conversation amongst the crowd. If you know, if you have something that you kind of want to say, want to chime in about it, disagree, disagree. You know, no, it's it's real talk. You gotta have it. So um, I'm sorry, Rashad. Before you before you carry on, I do want to just introduce myself to everyone here in the program. My name is Elisa Williams, and I work at the Albina Library on Northeast Knox Street. And I just want to say that I represent the, as Rashad mentioned earlier, the Black. Black Cultural Library Advocates, um, we as the BCLA, as a team, we work together to really provide resources for, for our community. And a lot of that includes our Black story time, resume help, any type of reference questions you have, anything that you can think of, we do our best to like reach out and, and ex, you know, be here for the community. So I do want to just offer, um, before we begin, just some housekeeping, some general housekeeping. I'm going to toss in uh, in the chat our our rules of conduct uh, for our virtual for our virtual programs. They're real, you know, it's real simple. Just enjoy, but enjoy yourselves. But we do, you know, we have some rules, but no big deal. Um, let's see. If there's anything else, Rashad, you ran right with it. And I was like, go brother, you professional. So <laughs> I don't really think there's much uh, more I could say because I feel like people who are here um, know you. But I do want to ask, what is the name of uh, the podcast again? That was um, Mr. Thompson's podcast. I got you, Rashad, you're muted, hang on. I don't know why, okay. Uh, uh, Sam's podcast is called We Just Talking. And uh, I believe it's gonna be available on, uh, Facebook's gonna be available on all media platforms. Is that correct, Sam? That is correct. So yes, uh, be looking for that. It's called We Just Talking. Uh, you can look for my podcast, it's called That's Dope. It's my opportunity to talk to people in the community that are doing great things. Sam Thompson being one of those people at one point. So. Uh, I'm almost positive I'll be talking to to Dre and Jamarte as we get as we move forward. But um, obviously today's conversation is around social justice, and um, that's a word that a lot of people have heard over the last little bit. Uh, it's taken on a lot of different meanings for people, so I just want to start there. And I, I guess I'm going to go ahead and start with with Dre. Dre, man, what is social justice, and how how do we define that? Uh, right now, social justice, man, is pretty much accountability and transparency. Um, that's what everybody is asking for. Um, social justice is getting justice for those African-American men and women that have been brutalized and killed and murdered by uh, police departments across the country. Um, getting justice for them isn't just arresting the police officers, and we've seen in several uh, recent cases, it, not even the police officers have been arrested or they have been let go on bail or bond, or even in some murder cases, you know, they get reassigned to death duty and then they, they become higher higher priority, you know, as, uh, as people start to forget about them, um, they get higher 
higher jobs and get promoted and stuff like that. So justice is actually uh, holding those killers accountable, um, charging them in the justice system, charging them for murder. Um, and that's what everybody on the streets is asking for right now is a defund of the police and redistributing of uh, funds. Sam, I'll ask you the same question, bro. And Jamarte, I'm going to give you a chance to answer as well if you'd like to. Thank you. Can we unmute Sam? There we go. I, def I got it. Um, so, yeah, I definitely, I definitely agree with Dre um, about the accountability and transparency. And it's also us getting and breaking down a system, right, that is created to keep a certain demographic of people uh, down. And so it's about us socially, right, and no matter what kind of socioeconomic or uh, different places and spaces that we come from, being able to be treated equitably, uh, where things are impartial, where things are fair, um, and just socially really giving everybody an opportunity to be successful. And so I think that's the biggest thing that we're looking to and just being very, very uh, cognizant of the fact that the system is not broken. The system is doing exactly what it is, what was created to do. And so for that to change, we have to break down the system that we currently have and create the one that we want. Um, so that's where kind of what I, what I look at is the, the social justice and racial justice piece. Yeah, I, I ask because to be real, there's there's no real definition of it. I think I mean I think people have come up with their kind of their their own definition of what they feel it is, but I haven't really heard a definitive answer as far as what exactly social justice is supposed to look like. Jamarte. I think, you know what I'm saying? Like you said, I agree with Dre and Sam. You know what I mean? But like you said, Rashad, I think it comes down to what do you define it as, right? So for me. I think, you know what I mean, me having the same equal, um, the same equal rights as somebody else who may not look like me or somebody who do look like me. You know what I'm saying? We just want you to handle the case and handle what's being done or what's going on accordingly. You know what I'm saying? Because oftentimes what happens is, is now we have these group of people, which are black folks, black and brown people in America, we're facing all types of, you know what I mean, adversity, you know what I'm saying? And have been. For so many years and so when you have a certain group of people who's being targeted and, and, and that's not getting justice and families are not being able to to really be at you never really at peace but at least you'll be at peace knowing that you got justice you know what i mean right. so i think that's the problem and so i think for me is just having the same just equal rights you know what i mean if 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 a case ain't sounding right and it is the police officer's fault, in this case, talking about police brutality, and the officer does some, you know what I mean, does some things out of turn, you know what I mean, and, and, and shoots, whether he kills right. or he don't, he should be, he or she should be punished for their actions, you know what I mean, specifically talking to police brutality. So I think just the equal rights, you know what I mean, handle the same way you would handle anybody else. And I think if you're going to give this person justice, this person deserves justice as well. So. I think that's really the main thing is right. getting the right justice, you know what I mean? And really looking at things from all angles, not just all oh, this side, this side, really, you know what I'm saying? Get the facts, put it together. And then wrong is wrong, right is right. I mean, you know what I mean? We was taught that as young kids. <laughs> right is right, wrong is wrong. You know what I mean? And you got to suffer the consequences for what you did wrong. And I think that's what the whole world and people who really out there fighting, um, you know, us being on the front lines, I think that's what we really, really ask them for is can we get the same equal rights as my other white counterpart or whoever else? You know what I mean? Can you handle me the same way that you did their case? You know what I mean? So I think that's, that's one of the main things as well. That, that, that's kind of a great lead in for my, for my follow up question then, because um, I was going to ask y'all, like I put on my Facebook earlier and just really, and really kind of before I came up with the, uh, most of my questions are really before I narrowed them down. And I asked, what is, what is equity? When you hear that, especially as a black person, when you hear the word equity, what is the first thing you kind of think of? And I got a lot of different responses because again, much like social justice, I think you're gonna hear many different responses depending on culturally, wherever your, whatever your background may be. Um, Dre, what is equity and what does it mean to you? Like what, it, what exactly is that? Because I think that's a word, especially now in the workforce and in schools, we're starting to hear more and more. But again, it's a word that's become more and more muddled because it's like, what does it really mean? 
Uh, I think you say equity. Uh, I think the best explanation that I've been able to come up with is you can give everybody equal rights, but everybody that isn't on that same playing field at the moment. You know what I'm saying? So if you give somebody that same equal right, say as a, a white person, you give a white person an equal right as a black person, that black person already has things against him in the system systemically that is already against him. So he's not on that same playing field as that white person, even though you gave him to you gave them the same equal part. You know what I'm saying? So to give somebody equity is to be able to give them the same to not give them the same, but give them the, the, the what they need to be able to extend, to be able to to get above and where that other person is. You know what I'm saying? We got to get on the same playing field as the is 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 white people. Or people of color have to get on the same playing field as, as white people, and that's by giving them equity. Marte? I ain't even going to lie to you. I've always thought it was a big word. <laughs> a big <laughs> word with, 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 with so many definitions. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, But, you, you know, I agree with Dre. You know what I mean? I mean, it just goes back to equality, I think. You know what I mean? When you're breaking that word down, I think that equal is in there somewhere. You know what I mean? Remind me if I'm wrong. So, but I, I think I think that's just the primary the primary thing is handling me the same way you would do somebody else. You know what I mean? Like I said before. So, I, I think I'm I'm gonna go ahead and stand behind Dre on this one. So, yeah. Sam, Sam, what you think, man? Because I mean, as somebody who's been in a situation as far as being uh, in a, a discrimination. Uh, situation, man, and seeing just how different things work as just as a promoter in the club, what they'll allow for you as opposed to what they'll allow for someone else. Does equity mean something to you different now, having gone through that situation? Um, so I think I look into uh, what the definition is, right? If we're talking about finance, it's, it's a value. You know, it's it, it's 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 looking at value in something. Uh, if we're talking from a financial stance, but if we're talking about the treatment of people. It's about being impartial and being fair, right? And so I believe that equity for us is, 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 is what Dre tapped on, is, is giving people what they need to be successful. Um, I think a lot of times we get caught up in, in speaking about equality. And equality is something that, you know, I believe that we, we need. But for us as Black people specifically, we need things to be equitable. We need equity, which means we need to be giving uh, whatever we need to be successful. So if we were being equal and I give everybody that's on this call a pair of size 13 tennis shoes, right? I gave everybody the same thing, but how many of us wear 13, right? So being equitable is meeting us where we're at and giving us what we need to be successful. The equitable way that we do that is ask everybody in here what size shoe they wear and then give them what they need. And so that, for me, is what equity uh, truly is. And that's what the difference between equality um, and equity is for me, just being impartial, being fair, and meeting people where they're at to help them get to where they want to be. So we've recently heard um, lots of discussion from uh, the White House in 45, and he's kind of you know mandating that there will be no more equity and diversity training in the workforce and schools. Um, we're all, you know, black men, speak, the people on the panel, we're only speaking for us. And we work in Portland, Oregon, which is an incredibly, it's an incredibly white place. You know, we've all been around certain microaggressions or, or things like that, that, you know, we pick up on, but maybe not a lot of other people, especially not being African-American or native or, you know, uh, Latino pick up on. Uh, so, my question to you is how important, how really important is it for uh, to continue to have these, you know, equity and diversity trainings in the workforce and also within our school system? Hey. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Oh yeah, so you know, um, that's what I do. I do contract work for different uh, agencies with diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, and I think it's a very, very important because our lived experience isn't everyone else's lived experience. And so a lot of times we get put into situations in the job site um, where people don't know, right? 
that they're doing something that is offensive or they're doing something that isn't uh, giving everybody an equal opportunity or they're doing something that could be viewed as a micro or a macro aggression. And I think the more that we have conversation and the more that we get to see each other on a, on a level of being human, um, I think that's why I, I do the restorative justice work that I do with our school district is because we need to build relationships. We don't have relationships. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I learned for working for SEI for so many years is that relationships are the most important thing that you can, that you can build. And that's about building community. That's about uh, creating accountability and responsibility. It's about being able to resolve conflict uh, effectively, um, critical thinking, all of these things. And I think that once we step into, well, I know, that once we step into the, the, the more uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion work, we're able to start having these conversations and facility, facilitating these conversations and letting people see where people are come from. So once you see where somebody's coming from, you see the way that someone else views them, it gives you um, opportunity to be empathetic to that. And I think uh, the more that we are involved in these conversations, the more that these conversations uh, are had, the better we are. I think a lot of times we we don't talk about stuff. And so if we don't know what's going on, we can't correct behavior that we know that we don't know that we're, that we're being wrong in. And so uh, the more that these DEI trainings are happening in schools and in businesses and in companies and in different spaces, uh, the better it is because dialogue creates change, right? You got to have some discomfort uh, to make changes. Absolutely. Uh, Marte, you work in a middle school. Uh, you've really worked in schools really since you've uh, finished up college. And even while you were in college, you made sure you came back and provided, you know, services as after school program staff and summer program staff. As somebody who's currently working inside of school, when we are able to currently work inside of schools, um, how important to you are those diversity and equity trainings uh, really for the, for the staff of the school? Listen, <clears throat> it's important because one of the reasons why I was able to come in into a brand new setting, come into a school setting per se, and have the impact that I've had, you know, going, you know, this this year being year two, is because of what Sam said, relationships, right? So there's a lot of kids who I knew prior to me working at Beaumont, just off relationships, whether I know their parents, whether they didn't come to SEI, whether I didn't talk or coach their brother or sister, like they already know who Marta is. And so for me, it's important because like Sam saying, a lot of people don't have our experience of what we have been through, you know what I mean, in our lifetime. And so when people may have the, the approach, the right approach, but wrong wording, you feel what I'm saying? So I, I, I think, I think the tensions are great. Yeah. And, and really understanding that, it's a culture, you know what I mean? And I'm not even talking about just black culture. It's a culture to just relate to kids. You know what I mean? Everything is changing every day. And so if you're just only stuck on your one, one mindset, then you're not going to be able to grow. These kids are changing every day. These generations are changing every day. And so one of the things is, is you got to be knowledgeable and you got to know what you're walking into. So for example, middle school kids, I mean, you're trying to find yourself, it's, you know, it's a lot of bullying, a lot of stuff going on because everybody's trying to find themselves. But if you can have somebody that can step in, if it's a situation where I can help the kid, be like, okay, hold on, what's going on? And actually listening to the kid. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people don't do is I think that's what's wrong in in the school system right now is certain teachers and certain educators and just certain people, we, we're not listening to the kids. The kids mm -hmm. that give you the information if you just listen. And I think if you're listening and if you key in that information and having that training and understanding like, okay, this kid has a perspective. Every kid has a story. Every kid has a perspective. Every kid has an, uh, has an, you know, like an experience, you know what I mean? Whether that's a white kid, black kid, native kid, Hispanic kid, Asian kid, it doesn't matter. And so if you're able to connect with kids on all levels, on all different ethnicities, then that's how I think you're going to be successful. I mean, with me, I'm going back to school because I want them to see how important it is to have a black man as a teacher. You know what I mean? I know the journey is not going to be easy. You know what I'm saying? The journey ain't never been easy. 
but I know how important it is for them kids, not only just the black and brown kids, but also for them other kids to, to be like, Mr. Marte was my first black male teacher. You know what I mean? Like, I want kids to be able to feel confident and feel proud to say that. And I think that's one of the things if we're talking about equity, we're talking about diversity, and we're talking about all of these things. And then guess what? Somebody got to do it. Hmm. Somebody, somebody got to stick their head in the water and somebody got to go swimming. And I'm, I'm one of those. I'm, and we glad to shoot, bro. And I'll be real. I'm pulling for you because you need to go ahead and teach in one of these schools, man. I want to make sure we go to Elisa, and I'm curious if we have any questions on the chat. We do. Thanks for asking. We've got a couple of questions here. I'm going to start with um, one from Israel. Do you think institutions can be equitable slash fair, especially when they are built on intentional in inequities? How do we facilitate that equity economically and politically as Black folk? Uh, Sam, you want to go with that one? Yeah, I believe um, they have the potential um, to do that. But I think that those that are being the most effective in a negative way by those institutions need to to invoice the inequities, right? Um, we, we know that in order for anything to happen uh, and for change to happen, a movement needs to be started. Um, and so a lot of these systems that we are that we participate in the systems that we have to learn to navigate and code switch through are created to do exactly what they're doing. And so for that to change, we have to change the way that we approach those institutions. And so with that, it's going to be tough, right? But we do have to uh, get with some folks that don't look like us, that see things the way that we do to get some movement behind it. Um, if, if, if our country has showed us anything, uh, no matter how much we as a people protest or march or yell or, or, or sit through certain situations, unless another demographic joins in that movement and joins in that, it doesn't have the same effect that it would. We know for a fact if these 150 days of protesting was happening with nothing but black folks downtown would have ended on day three. But the fact that people that don't look like us, the fact that they see their, their sons and their nephews and their nieces and their sisters and their cousins, excuse me, downtown uh, fighting for what they're fighting for right now is the reason why it's been able to go on as long as it can. And so if we want to change the way that these institutions and these businesses, and we have to find like-minded young folks um, that are white, <laughs> just, just to be clear with it, right? That are white, that see things the same way that we do um, and are willing to put their necks and their reputations and their time on the line to make things happen. But if we don't have the majority, uh, allegedly, um, the people in power uh, behind us, in those things, then it will be very difficult to happen. But if we do, and, we, and as we know, whatever we do put our mind to, whatever we do start, we, we create every trend, we create every, uh, everything, right? And so once we do uh, start trying to move in those directions and trying to straight and break down the system, because that's what it is ultimately, uh, right until something is completely changed it won't change and so right. the system trying to correct something that is doing exactly what it's intended to do is not going to happen you have to completely break down break down that system and then create one a new one uh that's for your benefit but it can happen but it's not going to happen with just us right. Right? and so that's why we can't get no justice is there another question alisa yes there is this one is from elon when will, sorry, will Start we ever, oh, am I still muted? No, sorry. Hi, Ms. Manley. Uh, <laughs> will we ever be equal when people view with different lenses? How does that change? I'll give that one to Dre. Dre, go ahead and attack that one for us. Yeah, and I wanted to chime in on the, uh, the equity training too, because I think that this was act, will actually um, tap into what Ms. Manley uh, has to say. But um, with, with Marte and Sam being on the inside and working in the schools, you know what I'm saying? Like, 
they're actually involved in these equity trainings. But me as a parent, I have seen it. I have seen it different. And what we need to do is we need to we need to be transparent with the parents, and we need to hold the school systems accountable um, because there are going to be people Absolutely. inside that system that come to these trainings that uh, are not open minded and don't want things to change. You know what I'm saying? So the ones that actually want things to change and that are part of the system, they need to hold those teachers accountable when they see things that are happening that aren't right. And I, that's the same thing with any type of system, wherever we go um, in the workplace. I mean, I just had it today in my work site. You know what I'm saying? Like we have to hold people accountable and, and I mean, I'm I'm willing to do this by any means necessary. You know, I mean, I'm I'm holding as a manager at my job. I'm 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 one of uh, there was before COVID. There was about a hundred employees, and I'm one of the only managers at my job. You know what I'm saying? And I'm holding other managers accountable for for things that they say that they might not. You know, that might offend some offend somebody or come off. You know what I'm saying? A different way. Uh, white fragility is something else that I've been, you know, going up against a lot in the workplace. Um, and that's Ex that we have to hold people. Explain white fragility. Like what, what, what exactly is that? Uh, white words. So, so fragility pretty much is, uh, you know, me as an experienced black person, having my experiences as a black person, explaining and voicing my experiences as a black person, or um, anything that I have went through or trying to um, say, I was organizing the Vanport um, uh, event, for example, and there were a lot of white people that were saying that I wasn't safe enough, that I didn't um, have the experience enough to be able to um, host this type of event. Um, but I live in the skin as a black man. I, I face racism every time that I go outside of my door, you know what I'm saying? So. Um, it's, it's white people coming to the defense um, of, of, of things that they feel like they have more experience or say so on and not really listening uh, to that black person experience. And you want to answer Ms. Manley? I'm sorry, can you repeat Ms. Manley's question, uh, Alisa, please? Yes, awesome. Yes. Will we ever be equal when people view um, with a different lens. I, I'm gonna make the assumption that they view us or they they have a different view. Yeah, I they, totally they, get they, it, yeah. that's every- All right, so there is a different view. Um, how does that change? It's, it's accountability. We have to hold everybody accountable. We have to weed them out. You know what I'm saying? We have to make it not acceptable for them to be able to have those type of behaviors. And the worst part about it is we have a, a, a president right now that's allowing those type of behaviors. So we see it more and more nowadays because he's allowing those type of behaviors. But as citizens ourselves in our workplace, in our school system, wherever we are, wherever we're effective at, we need to make sure that that's not acceptable and we need to hold everybody accountable. Very good. Um, if it's okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. If you, again, if you have questions, please make sure you type them into the chat. We wanna make sure that, you know, we, we address any questions we can, but also wanna make sure that uh, we get a chance to uh, ask some of the questions that we kind of had uh, planned. But please, if you have those questions, please make sure you put those in the chat. Um, I'd like to go back just a little bit, if we can. Um, to a very specific day. And to me, uh, the date that everything changed. Um, May 20th, 2020, uh, George Floyd was basically murdered on camera by uh, uh, Sergeant Derek Chauvin. I think I'm saying his name right. I don't know. I'm pretty sure I am. Is that a Chauvin? I'm always getting that wrong. But either way, uh, that was the man that uh, for eight minutes and 46 seconds, uh, knelt on George Floyd's neck until he passed away. Um, I'm curious because I've never seen the video. Um, I don't really want to see the video. I'm not really a glutton for punishment like that. And that would just make me even angrier than I already was. But I just want to know as a black man, having seen that or having heard about it or read about it in that moment, what was your initial reaction to that? And I'm gonna start with you, Monte. Honestly, I seen the video. 
I read, you know what I'm saying, and and also read the articles and you know all of that stuff. Honestly, I shed I, I shed a couple of tears. I shed a couple of tears because I'm look not only am I looking at George Floyd, but I'm looking at me. I'm looking at Dre. I'm looking at Sam. I'm looking at Rashad. I'm looking at my cousins. I'm looking at my grandpa. I'm looking at my uncle. And I think the relation in the black culture of us feeling those type of emotions because I feel like our culture, no, I don't feel like, I know our culture is so rich. And so when it comes to when you see somebody who looks like you, you know what I'm saying? George Floyd was a pretty big dude. I'm 6'4", 260 pounds. George Floyd was around that 6'5", 6'6", range. We're not too far, you know what I mean? So it was like, that easily could have been me. You know what I mean? And the feeling, honestly, the feeling is kind of unexplainable. Yeah. If you're a human, if you believe in humanity, there's no way that video didn't touch you in some type of way. Like, yo, this ain't cool. And like you said, I think that was the first, the first step in the last breath as far as I'm tired. I'm sick and tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. And I think that whole George Floyd video was just something that I can't even explain. But as a black man, you know what I'm saying? He's a father. I just recently became a father. You know, I'm a stepfather. I'm a fiance, soon to be husband. So I'm thinking about my family. Right. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? My, you know what I'm saying? My wife and my mom and my daughter's watching that. <laughs> you know I, I, I mean? wanted to, I want to stay with that real quick, Jamarte. And I'm going to ask this to Sam and to Andre uh, specifically. Um, Sam, you have a son just turned four here a little bit ago. Um, Jed is always with you. Everything you do when you're doing anything for social justice and stuff, he's right there. Dre, same with you. Uh, your kids are with you, man, in some cases on the front lines, man, doing all those things. When this happened, and I remember when, the, when we're looking at the initial riots, um, that it was a Thursday night. My son goes with his mom for a little bit on Thursday night and then, you know, comes back home at around eight. And he's watching these riots. I mean, we know what's happening and why is this happening. And for the first time, my son just turned nine here in August. I had to have the hardest, most uncomfortable conversation with him that I've ever had. And I'm curious for the two of you, for the two people that have kids, and in one case, man, kids are almost grown up. How difficult was that conversation to have with your baby about, man, what was happening? You want to go first, Dre? No, go ahead, go ahead Sam. Go ahead, go okay. Ahead. Um, so for me, again, like you said, uh, I'm like you, Sean. I didn't watch it. Never seen it. I've never uh, laid eyes on it because um, just what Marte said, man, in the same way, man, I'm a 6'4", 250-pound black man, right? So it, I saw myself in that and it's not the first time and so i got to a place where i became desensitized to my brothers getting killed right you know and, and so i i was hurt because my first initial reaction was like dang they did it again and that was it i didn't feel any i wasn't upset i wasn't i was like dang they did it again um and i think for me the thing that upset me the most is when i when i really thought about it then i started to hear the story and how long it was and you know, that the man cried out to his mama that had been gone. And, and, and that put me into a space of, man, I was hurt. Right. Um, and then I was more upset that now everybody's mad. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, now everybody's mad. Now, now, now we're all tripping. And I think that all comes into uh, uh, the sense of us being in the middle of a pandemic. And was, everybody yeah. was at home. 
and nobody Absolutely. else had nothing to do, and everybody yeah, was watching TV. And there nobody, wasn't a show, a concert, a basketball, basketball game, game, or nothing to be found in, on Earth, not just here in on the Earth. On Earth, everybody was shut down. So you had to see this, and it had to be put in your face, and 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 and, and we had to, you had to feel how we've always been feeling, right? And then on top of that. Man, we supposed to be six feet away. <laughs> you ain't even supposed to be touching nobody. And y'all spent eight minutes and 46 seconds on this man's neck during what's happening right now. We're going through a financial depression unlike anything we've seen in our lifetime. And y'all tripping that he might have had a fake $20. Man, of course, man, people trying to make it, right? So I went through all of those different emotions. And then my son, man, three years old, just turned four yesterday. Happy birthday, Jet. Happy uh, birthday, Jet. He... He said, Dad, why do white people kill black people? Mind you, we've never had this conversation. I've never talked to him about it. But my baby's very observant. And like you said, my son is with me everywhere. If I'm at a march, if I'm at a, uh, a meeting, uh, where I'm at right now, like he's, he's with me all the time, everywhere. And he listens. And he's been observing. He's been seeing. And for him, at that age, not knowing you know, can't even count to 25, <laughs> but he understands that we're having uh, where people that look like his dad and look like him. And my baby's a big boy. He's going to be a big boy just like his daddy, probably bigger. And the fact that that is intimidating and having to have conversations with him about how to move and how to maneuver and how to talk. And when he gets at an age to drive, how to drive and it's tough, man. It's tough. But I think that was one of the hardest things uh, for me with him is letting him know, no, nah, man, that's not what it is. Right. You know, what about right. Uncle Kelly? <laughs> you know what I'm saying Your Uncle Kelly's white. Right. He doesn't. You know, it's good people and everything, and it's bad people in a lot of different spaces. But I think speaking to what Dre talks about all the time is the accountability and the fact that people, the good people in those different jobs and different spaces, aren't holding the bad ones accountable. It makes us look at everybody the same way. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's how I felt about that. But again, man, I don't, I don't watch it. I ain't watch none of them because I don't want to never see that. I'm good. Dre. Uh, yeah, I, I've def I definitely watched the video. Um, and I was, I was just like Sam, man, I, I, I became numb to, um, seeing an armed black man, um, murdered in the streets you know what i'm saying so uh i was just the same way i was just like damn man they got another one of us you know um just thinking of uh, of my kids though is um i think it's important for us to be able to have our children um active as much as possible definitely when it's a safe environment for them because we're raising we're raising leaders um, I think one thing that would have helped me in the current movement is if uh, if my parents would have taken me into uh, movements in the past. Um, I've been involved in uh, Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, you know what I'm saying? I was too, too young for Rodney King, but I was still watching it on the TV and stuff like that. But I think it's really important for us to get our kids involved. And what I tried to do, I have two high schoolers, so what I tried to do from the start is get them on the front lines, get them leading the chants, leading the uh, the marches, and being able to speak speak from uh, from their opinion and things that happened to them um, from their experience. What you got, shot? Do y'all think we would be in this current movement? Do you think the movement would be as strong if it weren't for Corona and if it weren't for the the quarantine and everybody having to be? Do you think we could have uh, would I be think, would be would keep up the steam that it's kind of kept up as as long as it has? I think it was a boiling point for everybody, man, to be honest with you. It's not just, you know, uh, a lot of things playing into place to help it out. You know, I, I think it was a boiling point. It was a boiling point for me, man. After the first night, the march from Peninsula Park to the Justice Center, you know, I knew that I was going to be full-fledged into this, you know, and and, and I've been 100% committed ever since, and, and I, I've been organizing, you know, and there's there's no stopping to this current movement right now from what a lot of people are talking about. Um, so, I mean, I just think that it was just a boiling point. I mean, we not it wasn't just George Floyd, you know what I'm saying? It was three murders back to back. It was Ahmaud Arbery, it was, it was Breonna Taylor, it was, it was George Floyd, you know what I'm saying? So all, all of those 
instances put together, you know what I'm saying, reach the boiling point. Marge, do you want to answer that? So we, we, if you think about it, if if on a on a on a spiritual tip, nothing else mattered. No basketball game, no you know what I'm saying, no sports, even school. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like nothing else was important because I think people. I think it was time for people to stop whatever you're doing and we need you to pay attention to what's really happening. And if you're oblivious, if you think it don't exist, you know, for Eric, you know what I'm saying? For people who don't think racism still exists and, you know, for people who don't, oh, everybody's treated equally and, you know, there's nothing wrong with the system. There's all of that stuff. I really hope they open their eyes. Because like Sam said, all we had the time to do was be at the crib with your family or whoever and pay attention and listen and see. You know what I mean? Nothing else mattered. Not no job, no none of that mattered at the time. And so I think just like Dre said, it was a breaking point. You know what I mean? Like that was just the last of the last. And I remember going to Peninsula. You know what I mean? I didn't march all the way downtown, but then the, the day after I was down there ever since. And so it was just, it was just, it's crazy because I think, you know, this, this world has a, has a, has a way of stopping you where you are in your tracks yeah. and really checking you, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? And really checking you and really check who you are as a human. I don't care if you're black, white, no other color. I'm talking about you as a human, you as a as a as an individual on this earth. And so I feel like without Corona, without the quarantine, without everybody being at a standstill, I don't think a lot of eyes would have been as open because a lot of people who was well, a lot of people who still think in the same way, who think certain things don't exist. Unfortunately, they still oblivious. Now, you shouldn't be oblivious because now I feel like it's a choice. You're choosing not to want to pay attention or learn. So it's crazy. Everybody's eyes are open now, man. You can't yeah. but to but to notice it. And really, the eyes of the social justice movement have moved squarely here to Portland, Oregon. Um, for 100 days of protest, which is, you know, which was at first it was weird because Portland is not an incredibly black place as far as its residents. So I'm curious, and I'm going to start with you, Dre, because I know you've been really the, one of the champions and on the front lines of these things. Like, why do you think these protests have been so important? Like, D.C. hasn't done this much, and Atlanta hasn't protested this much. Uh, all these cities that, have, that are just rich with Black people and Black culture, they haven't had this many days of protests. But right here in Portland, over 100 days, why is it so important to, hear, uh, to the people here in Portland? Uh, I think there's a lot of factors to play into that. I think one of them is politics. Uh, I think with us being a democratic state, um, President Trump, you know what I'm saying, has an agenda out on all uh, blue states. Um, and he has said that, you know what I'm saying, against uh, against democratic uh, go governors and, uh, and senators and stuff like that. And him and Ted Wheeler have had some back and forth. Um, I have talked with a lot of uh, cross-country activists, Frank Nitti, um, a lot of other people, uh, uh, Gary Floyd. I've actually been working with him closely, George Floyd's cousin. He actually is uh, he currently here in Portland, Oregon, doing a lot of activists and organizing stuff. But I've talked with a lot of them, and we've had a lot of panels. And Portland isn't the only ones protesting right now. Portland is actually the only ones that are actually getting on the media. And, and, and the media attention that we're getting – isn't the stuff that's actually happening, you know what I'm saying? So I do want to speak on that a little right. bit because there is positive stuff that's out there happening and, and the little percentage of the, the chaos or the fires and stuff like that, you know what I'm saying, is the only stuff that actually gets the media attention. And that's the stuff that gets the media attention and plays into Donald Trump's uh, whole agenda and stuff like that. And that's why we're, why we're kind of hyper, hyper focused right now uh, and getting all the attention um a lot of black organizers are getting together 
um, trying to, the narrative has been stolen. You know what I'm saying? We talk about this the whole, a lot, a lot of the time as far as like making sure that our message is clear, uh, our agenda is straight, our narrative, you know what I'm saying? Making sure that we aren't, uh, we aren't for violence. We aren't the ones that are actually out here doing the fires and the looting and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, Portland isn't really, like, just the focal point, uh, but media is portraying us as a focal point and in the wrong way also. Understood. Uh, Alisa, we have... I just have, a, I just have a quick question. I'm, Andre, just kind of to piggyback. Is there any media that you would recommend that Black media that you would recommend for um, for allies to be like really paying attention to, to, you know, just to kind of offer more, more, I don't know, more of our own voices, more community voices that kind of counter what mainstream media is putting out there about, about us, about, you know, and about the protests. So and we actually just that, does anyone else have any questions for our panelists? Chat is still open, just want to let you know. So we actually just got done having a, a meeting with all of the streamers and we're trying to make sure that the streamers get on the same page. And, and what that is, is when we actually have these events and we have these protests and stuff, we have black leadership that are up there actually um, uh, expressing their, their their feelings and their, their experience and stuff on, on their platform and being able to speak so when things happen in the background, the streamers don't need to run to that chaos. And a lot of the streamers that are out, no, I don't want to say a lot of them because I don't want to characterize them like that, but some of the streamers that are out there right now are actually doing it for, for monetary reasons. You know what I'm saying? So when they do see that chaos, they, they know that their, their uh, viewership wants to see that. So then they go run and then they go start filming that when they actually are taken away from the message in the young black people that are actually on stage speaking right then and there. So we are working with different streamers right now to make sure that um, we are portraying it the right way. There is a lot um, of black organizers working together behind the scenes to make sure that we are able to portray our narrative going forward, especially after the election, whichever way that goes. Very good, man. It's a great one. And again, if there are any questions, please make sure you put those in the chat. We want to make sure we get some of your questions answered before we uh, reach the end uh, of today's uh, event. Uh, I want to ask this. So we've had our protests. They've been going on. Um, lots of attention to the issues of black and brown people uh, here in, in Portland and across the country. But as activists for you guys, what's the, what are the next steps? You know, now that now that the protests have happened, what are we asking for? Um, I think I'll tap into this real quick. Uh, and that's kind of while I'm up here at Emmanuel Church right now um, with the Black Men and Women United is, and, and, me and me and Dre, we've sat in a lot of meetings together and we're talking about while, you know, Dre and, and all the amazing folks that are out here really with their feet to the pavement, uh, making, making this change and making this impact, what's next, right? And, and we're seeing that uh, even with what's going on with Ice Cube right now, right? It's what is our plan, right? Because this is not the first time that we've 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 rallied, the first time we marched, the first time it might be the longest uh, in our lifetime. Uh, but again, when we are when we are faced to getting into these spaces and having these conversations, what's our plan? What's next? What are the things that we want to do? What are our demands? What are the things that are non-negotiable? What are the things that we need to feel that we can create a self-sufficient and self-reliant community? Um, and so that's some of the work that we're doing over here with the Black Men and Women United and identifying six pillars of work that we need to get done uh, in our community that we need to focus on. And the first one, man, is education. Right. Uh, education, creating um, our own curriculum and our own narratives. We, we learned so much false information growing up and was so misinformed uh, that as adults, when we did see the truth, we didn't believe it. Uh, and so we've learned with what's happening right now is that we don't need a, a building to have school. So what does that look like going forward? What, what, what things are we putting into education? Like Dre said, right? We're in the building, we're doing the work, but our parents are not part of the PTA. We're not 
in the meetings. We're not at the diversity and equity and restorative justice and all of these courageous conversations, trainings as parents. What can we do about that? How do we, how do we change that? Uh, the next pillar um, is economics. You have to have money to go to war. <laughs> you you have to have challenge. money to go to war. You can't go to war without no money, right? And so, and, and, and if we're not in a physical war, we are in a, a, a war right now. And so we have to change our economics. We have to raise our median income in our community. We have to raise black home, home ownership. We have to create uh, different investment opportunities. We have to be able to be self-sufficient. Our dollar does not rotate in our community, but one time it comes in and it goes out. Other communities money rotates right. 22, uh, 15 to 22 times before it leaves our community. So we have to get in that economics. Um, community and social, uh, community policing, right? We need to be able to be in charge of our own and be able to be in our own communities and be able to treat our communities the way that they need to through prevention and intervention and transition um, the, through the different programs that we have. Uh, when we spoke to is media, we have to control our narrative. We have to control our story. Um, a lot of times we run through different media outlets that intention is not ours to tell right. our story and we have to get away from that. We need to focus on, we have two black newspapers in the city. We have a black radio station. We have uh, everything, man. People, our, our, our news comes from the internet. You don't sit at home and watch the news no more, right? So we need to be able to con control that. Um, next is man, healthcare. We're not, we're not healthy. We're not mm -hmm. taking care That's of ourselves right. in the way that we need to. We're not living to the life expectancy that we should. Um, so we need to make a big focus on that. And then the last, the last pillar that we focus in the sixth, the final pillar um, is policy. We have to get into policy and politics. We have to have a voice. Um, I think a lot of times we get caught up in the national government um, into a system that is completely flawed, but we don't, if we've learned anything from COVID-19 is that city, state and local government control what, what happens to you directly. We've seen the, the government make federal mandates and then the governor say, nah, we ain't doing that. Then the governor say that we about to do this and then the, the mayor say, nah, we ain't doing that, right? And so the true power that we have, we need to be able to focus on our city councils, on our city commissioners um, and, and where we have direct influence. So again, man, it's education, economics, uh, media, healthcare, community policing and, and policy and politics. Uh, and those are the six pillars that we're focused on, on, and that's what we want to create. And when I say we, it's us. It's not me. Um, it's not Dre. It's not Marte. It's not you. It's we. It's us as a collective. And right. what we believe is best for all of us uh, to move on and to create a self-sufficient and self-reliant community, man. Dre, you sent me a list of demands, actually, that you were uh, putting your, your team were, were going to take. And I'm, I can't remember who you said you were going to meet with. But that was kind of some of the list of things that you were saying as a community we were asking for. What are what are some of those things that were on that list if, if Sam hadn't already mentioned? Hey Sam, can you can you tell the people how they can get tapped in with you um, on your uh, your Wednesdays that you be doing and where that's at? Yes, sir. So every Wednesday at six p.m. Uh, we were meeting at Wilshire, but you know Portland. Uh, the weather has changed. It's getting darker earlier. And so uh, Bishop C.T. Wells at Emmanuel Church has opened up the space to us. Yes, indeed. So uh, we're here every Wednesday at 6 p.m. to discuss the six pillars, uh, the key parts of those pillars that we're going to attack. For more information, you guys can go on Facebook. Um, we have a Black Men and Women United page that, that shares the information. Um, also, I'm Samuel Thompson on Facebook. You guys can tap in with that. And like, just like anything, right? Um, we have to stop being reactive to stuff and start being more, more proactive in the work that we're doing in this community. Uh, when we were having all of the shootings and all of those things and this, all this stuff was, was sensationalized and it was, it was popular at the time. We were having 100 to 150 people every Wednesday. I'm in here right now with five, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So uh, the work is being done. It's gonna continue to be done, but we all need everybody uh, together to make this happen. So yeah, every Wednesday, 6 p.m., we'll be at Emmanuel Church, uh, 1033 North Sumner. I think Thanks, one, I think, yeah, for sure. I think one important thing um, to know is the, the things that are actually happening on the streets as far as the protesting and stuff, 
that is actually putting in the work for Sam to be able to do what he's doing right now, for Marte to be able to do what he's now yeah, sure. and actually get, get changed for it right now. You know what I'm saying? Like the things that's happening in the streets are applying pressure so we can actually get changed in the seats or behind the scenes. Me, Sam, and Marte have been be- meeting since day one. You know what I'm saying? We had a black leadership meeting with the uh, the elder black community uh, members in the community, you know what I'm saying? And brought everybody together. We're all tapped in together, you know? And, and it right. all plays the same type of role because just as you spoke on Rashad, the demands that we uh, actually have as activists have been passed around to several different black activists in the community. Not only have they been passed around to several different black activists in the community, but professionals from those actual fields have actually tapped into those demands too. Uh, So just like Sam says, he has pillars. We have certain pillars also, and a lot of those pillars are the same. So for the demands, we have education, we got healthcare, we got housing and property, you know what I'm saying? And, and, um, and, and criminal justice reform. So right. those are the four ones that we have. We tapped in with people that have been fighting criminal justice reform for years. We tapped in with Libra Ford, who has actually just got voted on to be uh, on the Oregon Board of uh, Education. You know what I'm saying? And, and she gave her her input on um, on the demands for education. We've tapped in with healthcare professionals. You know what I'm saying? We've tapped in with everybody in those different fields and active people on the streets is actually demanding uh, change. So we're trying to put this all together. And some of those pillars actually go for what Sam's actually working on also. So we're demanding things that need to change to be able to reinvest in what Sam's actually working on. That's defunding and redistributing. Absolutely. Great answers, guys, both of you, man. Um, it looks like we're about almost out of time. It looks like, is that right, Elisa, about almost out of time? So I guess I got time for one more question-ish. And I guess kind of if you could make it, I don't want to call it a rapid answer, but, you know, try to make it as quick as we can. Uh, there's a pretty big election coming up here um, within the next couple of weeks, man. How important is it to get out there to vote? Or do you believe it is that important to go ahead and vote this year? Let's talk to you, Marte. Crazy if you don't. <laughs> She's right. That part. <laughs> um, me. Oh, I'm sorry. I- me, uh, me personally, because I've been gone playing football and doing my thing for, you know, for numerous years, college and professionally, this is actually my first time voting, you know, as a 25 year old black man, you know what I mean? So this is going to be my first time actually voting. And I'm so excited, you know, because I know how important it is. You know, I know that I'm a I'm a leader to a certain generation, whether that's my generation and the generation behind me. You know what I mean? And so I want to I want to put forth the work that I'm talking about. So if we're talking about voting, if we're talking about doing the things that we need to do, you know, so we can all, you know what I mean, be on the same page, then I got to do my part. So I'm going to vote this year, you know what I mean? And and I'm, I'm, I'm really praying and hoping that, you know, everything turns out to be what we want it to be, which right. is better leadership, which is somebody that's in office, that's compassionate, that understands, you know what I mean? That know what it's like as far as just to be against all odds, you know what I mean? And, 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 and that's regardless of skin color. I'm just talking about just against all odds in life. And so I just, man, this is so important because I know the generation after us, our kids, I know, you know what I'm saying? For my, for my stepdaughter and daughter, I'm setting an example for them. You know what I mean? Because I know how important it is for them growing up, you know, to understand that, hey, stepdad and dad, like he going, you know what I'm saying? He going to make sure that he put his best foot forward when it comes to the people. You know what I mean? I'm a man of the people. And so I'm going to do what's best for the people. You know what I mean? And and, and I'm going to tell you like this, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) Like Ms. Manley said, you'll be a fool not to. You'll be a fool not to. You know what I'm saying? They say every vote count. Well, we shall see. But you got to make sure you do your part. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Obviously, everybody got their own, you know, views and opinions about voting, especially with our options that we have. But, hey, it got to start somewhere. 
right? Very good. <laughs> Dre, how you feel about that, bro? Uh, I mean, man, voting is, is is very critical right now, you know what I'm saying? And not just on a national scale, you know what I'm saying? We got to make sure that we vote here locally. Absolutely. Because they want to make all the laws. Absolutely. Here locally, it matters because this Every is where we years. live in that, you know what I'm saying? So the candidates that's up for, uh, up for election as far as the mayor race, you know what I'm saying? We need to make sure we're looking into those. We need to make sure that we tap into that. I ain't going to get into that, you know what I'm saying, on this platform, but we need to make sure we're looking at that. The city council board, uh, we need to make sure that we're looking at uh, measure 26-217, which is real police accountability. And I'm voting yes on it, you know what I'm saying, personally, because we need police accountability here in Portland and nationwide also. But what I really want to say is it, it's not just a national uh, election right now that we need to be paying attention to, even though that's getting the biggest uh, media attention. We need to be paying attention to our local elections and our local measures. Absolutely. Samuel, what you got for us, bro? Yeah, people die for us to vote. Take advantage of that, man. Vote. No matter who you vote for, right? It's yours. You have ballot you fill out, you fill out by yourself and you send it out by yourself. Ain't nobody business. But we know. Uh, nationally, we both, we picking between doodle and pee right now, man. So <laughs> figure out which one you want. Uh, but like Dre said, man, local government is the most important. Get up on these bills, understand what's happening. That's what's going to affect your day-to-day -day life. All that other mess, man, I've lived the same through Reagan till now, man. You know what I'm saying? So, but locally, that is what matters. Your local vote, your city, your state. Your local vote is what matters. Please, please, please don't sit this one out. Uh, that national mess is going to play out how it's going to play out, and they're going to be tripping either way. So, but locally, make sure that you vote. Take advantage of the opportunity. Man, people die. People die for you to have an opportunity to vote. So make sure you do that. And voting is, is unbelievably important. Absolutely so. it is, man. Please make sure you vote, vote, man. You can absolutely drop off the ballots. I believe it, the library is that is that correct yes that that is true Up all of our 19 locations have ballot boxes you can you can yes. just drop them off right there yes and make sure y'all vote for marte mayor 2025 it's coming make sure you, are, <laughs> you heard it here first marte mayor 2025 yes is incredible that's not even a year <laughs> so let's make sure that we all get out there <laughs> and get yourself voted for man i appreciate everybody for, for the hour hanging out with us, man. I especially appreciate, man, the Multnomah County Library staff, BCLA. Thank you guys. Pro Library Advocates, man. Uh, Alisa, Miles, you guys are awesome. Lindsay, thank you so much for all of your help, man. To my panelists, man, Samuel Thompson, Dre Miller, Marte Brown, man, thank you so much, brothers. I appreciate y'all for coming on. Shy, thank you for having us. Dre, thank, thank, you, all. thank you all for participating. Soon, thank man. you. Really appreciate well, you it. link soon. Absolutely, man. So make sure you listen to Sam's podcast. We just talking. I'm going to be on it soon. I don't know what I'm going to say, but I'm going to talk. I'm going to say I something. I got you. All I right, appreciate you, you all. <laughs> That's what's up, man. I appreciate you all. Hopefully, I'll be able to see you again. Have a good one. Good night. Okay. Thank you. If, if you would like to see more programming centered around the Black experience, we would love to have your feedback. I've included a survey in the chat as well as a con as an email contact library events at mult multcolive.org. Please tell us what you'd like to see. Tell us if you'd like more of this. Tell us what you tell us what we would love to, what, what we can do for you. We and love just feedback. Let, you, let you know that next Next Wednesday, this same time, we are having another Real Talk event. So you can go to our website, multicolib.org, and look under events and, and register for another virtual event. Same time, 6 to 7, next Wednesday. Thank you all. Thank you all. And there's a link in the chat. So there you go. All right, everyone. Take care. Rashad, thank you.